You might be wondering why. Oh, why yet another webinar series? Uh, do we really need it? And not to mention on a Friday afternoon. So given the incredible turnout here today, uh, far, I think that the far, exceed, far exceeding our wildest expectations, I think that the answer to this question is a resounding yes. I am delighted to see not only Europe represented here, because that was our first, at least this is the, our, the focus that we first had in mind. And when I say Europe, uh, Europe that goes beyond its usual Western centric scope. Um, so we not only have Europe here, but also participants from Australia, Singapore, New Zealand. And if you are from some other country that I am not aware, please uh, make sure that you tell us. Um, the idea uh, for the series was to look for the next big thing in open science with a focus on Europe. So um, as a nonprofit mission-driven publisher, PLOS is developing and looking for innovative projects in open science. We like innovators and we want to learn from their experience. So for this series, I will bring together open science visionaries to discuss new horizons in open science. We will look into exciting emerging trends and initiatives. We will discuss, challenge each other, hopefully we will disagree, and perhaps uncover something groundbreaking in the process. Our format is all about conversation, no PowerPoint presentation allowed. We want a rich, engaging discussion. So for the next 45 minutes, we will be talking, uh, meaning me and our three panelists, and uh, they will share their insights, and then we will open the floor for your questions and thoughts. So let us dive into our topic today, how open bibliometrics can reshape scholarly communications. So we have a stellar lineup of speakers here with us. First is Leticia Bracco, who is a library curator in the research support mission at the Université de Lorraine Libraries. She is in charge of the Adoc Lorraine, which is data workshop, the support service for research, research data, as well as the bibliometrics unit. At the national level, she leads the research data working group of the Couperin Consortium. She's also a project leader for the French Open Science Monitor uh, on research data and software code. And at the international level, she coordinates the Open Science Monitoring Initiative. She's also a member of Spark of the Spark Europe Board and of the Open Science Program Reviewers Pool of Swiss universities. On a more personal level, she's a huge fan of video games like Diablo and Mass Effect. Welcome, Leticia. So now, Ludo, Ludo Waldman is Professor of Quantitative Science Studies and Scientific Director at the Center for Science and Technology Studies at Leiden University. Ludo is co coordinator of the Leiden ranking, we will be talking about it later, a bibliometric ranking of major universities worldwide. Ludo is, open, is also open science ambassador of Leiden University, and he has also co-developed the VOS viewer software for bibliometric visualization. Ludo is also one of the key people behind the Barcelona Declaration on Open Research. We will we'll also talk about it later. He's passionate about improving the way the research system is operating and ultimately how the system serves humanity at large. Welcome, Ludo. And now, last but not least, we have Jason Portenoy, who's a data engineer, data scientist, and researcher on the science of science. And at Open Alex, uh, he focuses his efforts on user engagement and outreach. His responsibility is to understand the open Alex data set, its strengths and limitations, and work with the user community to improve it and make it easier to use. He has a bachelor's degree in neuroscience from Brown University, and I am very happy to report that he is also my fellow Husky with a PhD in information science from the University of Washington. On a more personal level, um, Jason was in a mariachi band in college where he sang and played the guitaron. And he recently had a chance to showcase his skills as he sang with a full mariachi band in Mexico. So welcome, Jason. And Jason, I think that after this sensational uh, information about you and the mariachi band, I will have to go to you first with the first question of this <laughs> panel, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. 
Great. So Jason, um, the scholarly communications community has long discussed open access, open science, open data. And now it seems that there is a new buzzword and that is open bibliometrics. So could you shed some more light on what open bibliometrics actually are? What, what are we talking about? So we're talking about the high level um, uh, metrics behind uh, the scholarly uh, communication ecosystem and the scholarly publishing e ecosystem. So um, the, the science that, that scientists produce uh, going back to, to the beginning of science, but the beginning of scientific publication, um, there's, there, we, we refer to it as a scientific knowledge graph. It's not just a database of, of publications that come out. It's, it's a whole bunch of interlinking in entities, right? It's, it's the papers, it's the authors, it's the citations between papers, it's the, uh, institutional affiliations, geographical information. All of this can, can give a lot of insight about the, uh, the production of science, the direction of science, the the formation of ideas, and um, it's it's uh, it, it can start to address questions. And uh, you know, as a as a science of science researcher, like a lot of really exciting questions. Some of which we don't even um, know about yet. Like we don't know the questions. Making all of that open. Uh, traditionally, it it has been um, siloed in in. Uh, several proprietary databases uh, co collecting this information, um, and and those proprietary databases have been enormously useful and and uh, helped advance this, this field a lot. But they have a, uh, they have these drawbacks, um, and we can talk about them more. But the open side of this and where Open Alex fits in is about making these these bibliometric analyses, these the, the scientific knowledge graphs, uh, all of the insight that can be mined from from these interconnected networks uh, and data, uh, making that completely open, transparent, and um, collaborative, uh, because we're it's a data set. Um, it relies heavily on, uh, on or it, it, it depends heavily on, on the source of the data, the, the uh, data curation, and it can have errors, but um, working together as a community uh, and um, someone like Open Alex stepping in and, and being a central part of that and, and uh, fostering that community, I think, is a, is a huge part of, of open bibliometrics and what makes it open. Thank you, Jason. Um, so I'm hearing words as transparency, interconnectedness, collaboration when it comes to open bibliometrics. Ludo and Leticia, is there anything else that you would like to add to this? Well, I won't say definition, but at least at least the way we think about open bibliometrics. Um, I, I, I can start if you if you want. Um, sure. Yeah, um, I, I, I think uh, one thing also very important is to to have in mind that this is a new era where uh, everyone who is doing curation business for his own institution, it's going to have an effect on everyone and it's going to be um, really useful for everyone. And that's really what's new for in open bibliometrics, I guess. Thank you, Ludo. Now I can perhaps add, 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 add one more thing to this. So, um... Thinking about why I personally, why I am so passionate about this, why I really believe this is this is such an important development. For me, in the end, this is I think about all of us in the academic system, um, and in particular those of us who are kind of in positions where we make decisions that are kind of important. Um, all of us uh, being able to really make these decisions in the best possible way, because the data, the, the scientometric, bibliometric data, that data is often used to inform the decisions that we make. And there's a lot at stake in many of these decisions. It's about careers of people. So it's for individual researchers, scholars, academics, there's a lot at stake. And even more importantly, uh, there's a lot at stake for all of us together, also outside the academic system, because ultimately we want, of course, the, the research system to serve uh, our humanity in the broad sense. Um, and that means we need to make the right decisions. And in order to 
improve the quality of our decision making. The things that 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 were just mentioned by Jason and Leticia are so important: the transparency, the 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 the, the openness, inclusiveness of the data. So that's why ultimately I think this is something we should all be pursuing, this, this open bibliometrics. Thank you, Ludo. That sort of is a very nice segue to my next question because um, I actually wanted to stir, stir the pot a bit here. So please tell me, why should we care about open bibliometrics? And are they truly superior to the current system that we have, or do they come with their own set of challenges? And if so, what challenges can you see? And this is a question to all of you. So whomever would like to go first. I go first. <laughs> I you think first. Um, okay. there are two types of answers to this question. So on the one hand, um, there are very detailed technical questions about um, quality of data, accuracy of data, and we can have very uh, um, uh, extensive discussions about that. So for instance, the, the data that Jason and, and, and the team of Open Alex are producing, how does that data compare to other data sources, also more traditional proprietary data sources? Um, does that data indeed kind of reach uh, the same uh, quality standards or does it perhaps even exceed these standards or are we not yet there? We can have all these discussions and that's these are important discussions to have. Um, but I also think that, that there's something which uh, the movement towards open bibliometric data, something it offers that by definition is better than what we what we are used to, what we had in the past. And that is, of course, the openness itself, the full transparency of the data. And that means that we can now use the data, apply the data in ways that previously were simply impossible. So even if perhaps we need to conclude that in a certain sense, data from Open Alex, but also from other open infrastructures, open data sources, if that data is not yet in terms of kind of traditional measures of quality and, and accuracy, not yet at the same level as, as, as more traditional data sources, even then I would argue we are making uh, very important, crucial progress because the openness of the data, for instance, enables us to use bibliometric indicators, bibliometric statistics in much more responsible ways in research assessments. Um, it's a movement away from black box indicators, indicators that you just need to trust because someone tells you like this number is very important. And someone thought very carefully about, about what it means and how it should be calculated. From now on, we can actually reproduce uh, uh, all these numbers ourselves. We can check them, we can challenge them if we don't like them. Um, and that will, means we can do more responsible assessments and better decision making. And that's that's uh, a way in which we are really making hugely important progress, I believe, by moving towards open bibliometrics. Yes, and Ludo, that was very well said. And um, you, you stressed the importance of the, the uh, transparency um, aspect of, of the openness and, and using it responsibly. Um, I, I'd also like to add the the uh, components of accessibility and uh, inclusivity um, that uh, that the 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 expensive nature of, of the proprietary data sources have shut out a lot of people who who want to uh, use the data to to make decisions and to and to learn things. Um, Open Alex is completely open and, and the data is and always will be completely free. Um, uh, so um, it's it's really open to to uh, to be used by so many more people and, and um, people who, who were shut out uh, traditionally. Um, I think uh, Ludo mentioned data quality and curation as, as one of the main challenges and um, I think although Open Alex is uh, is closer than you might think to to matching the quality of proprietary data sources in a lot of the ways that people care about and actually surpass them in, in other ways, um, we do we do still have some work, but we are improving extremely fast. And the work that we're doing to improve and the collaborative nature of the work means that as as Leticia mentioned. Uh, this work will be uh, 
out in the open and will help everybody. Uh, and and so hopefully will not be needed to, to do over and over again as uh, you, if, if open hours were to go away and, and somebody else uh, were to take it up. It's all, it's, it, that's the part that's in the public domain and, um, and useful to everyone. I think the, the other two big challenges are um, about sustainability. Uh, again, the data is all free. Um, so we, we don't get money to uh, keep ourselves going just from offering the data. And that is a, a, definitely an ongoing challenge. And we could have a lot of discussions about that. We have, um, we, we, we have a lot of ideas and a lot of uh, a, a, a solid sustainability plan in place. And I think we're doing a great job with that. Um, but it is a challenge to, to be uh, an open community and, and keep ourselves going. Um, and that's, yeah, that's the reality of the situation, unfortunately. The other part which ties into that is, is adoption. Um, and, you know, we need people to get on board. And um, so that's that's why Ludo and Leticia are here. Uh, they are, um, you know, doing a great job with that. There are, uh, there are varying opinions on that and some early adopters and some people trailing. And uh, that's, you know, always the way it is. But I think we're, we are at a, a crucial moment here where the adoption is possible and um, people like Lacey Shin and Ludo are, are getting on board and the momentum is, is building. Yeah, I can only agree with what was just said. Uh, really open bibliometrics means that everyone can do bibliometrics and not only, uh, it's not only, not anymore, uh, I would say a privilege for some happy few uh, who can afford uh, proprietary databases. Um, and I think also what's really important with open bibliometrics is that finally we are taking into account um, every kinds of scientific production. Uh, for so for so long we have been so fo have been so focused on scientific articles in some uh, disciplinary areas. Um, in France, for example. Um, we have national KPIs, which are using a proprietary database, a proprietary database, which is ignoring a large part of this scientific production, especially in humanities, but also in informatics. And also um, it's a database which is um, really uh, giving visibility to um, publications in English, English only, and um, I think it's a problem not to have also a visibility for uh, um, non-English uh, publications. So that's one of the advantages. Uh, for the challenges, I would say that um, I, I hope that many, many people and institutions will get on board. And uh, what's going to be um, a bit tricky is to organize the creation. Um, who will be in charge of the creation for a given institution? Um, does everyone have the right to curate how, how this is going to work out? But I, I'm pretty confident. I am, I guess it, it will, it will be fine, but we have to, to, to create an organization. And also um, we are, really enthusiastic about open bibliometrics, but let's not forget that uh, it will not settle the question of the bias. Uh, we are still thinking of uh, counting the citations, um, and this is not an issue that will be um, um, necessarily um, uh, cleared with open bibliometrics. We still have um, this way of of thinking that we have to work on, uh, but uh, it's a challenge that we can face, I think. Thank you so much. And thank you for speaking so openly about challenges uh, so that we are realistic about, um, about what we are actually doing here. Ludo, I am very interested um, because we were talking a little bit all, on a theoretical almost level about open bibliometrics, and I would like to talk about a tangible project. 
So um, you've worked with Open Alex uh, to create the Leiden Ranking Open Edition. So could you share uh, your experience and what motivated you to use open bibliometric tools for this project? Uh, yes, yeah, happy to say something about that. Well, what motivated me and not just me, but actually the whole team of my center, of the uh, Center for Science and Technology Studies here in Leiden, uh, the motivation was actually that we uh, made last year a principal decision that we are going to fully move from traditional to open bibliometrics, or we sometimes call it open research information. That was the principal decision that we made. And that's a commitment that we made. And that is kind of a promise that we need to fulfill in the next few years. Um, and then we were thinking like, okay, we kind of feel this is the right time to take that step. And we want to be at the forefront of these developments, not be the last that's going to make the, the switch. Um, but being at the forefront also kind of, well, create certain risks. It's, uh, and, and so how are we going to do this? And we thought our uh, Leiden ranking, the Leiden ranking that we actually are producing now for, for more than 15 years, that Leiden ranking has a lot of visibility. Um, uh, it has a certain reputation, especially the rigor of the bibliometric statistics has a, has a reputation. And we thought if we can show that the Leiden ranking can be reproduced in a fully open way, then we do two things. First of all, we show our commitment, so the commitment of my center to this transition to openness. So it's not just words, but we're actually really doing it. But second, we also show that in terms of data quality, data curation, the, the, we have reached a certain level where it is actually possible to do these things, to trans, transform these large scale uh, bibliometric tools from proprietary to open data. So that's why we did it. Um, and that took quite some effort and we had a great uh, collaboration actually with the Open Alex colleagues, um, they helped us a lot. Um, and I believe we were actually quite successful. So after about one year of work, it was really a lot of work, but after one year, we could release the ranking in January this year. Um, the question that everyone always asks is, okay, but is it as accurate as the traditional ranking? Well, the answer is perhaps not yet. Um, we actually monitor that really very closely, like what is the data quality, data accuracy. Um, and in the course of this whole year in which we did the development, actually, we spent a lot of time working with the Open Alex team to improve data quality because there were things that needed improvement. At the end of that year, so the final thing that we produced and that's now online, um, I believe we are able to offer a, a statistics, bibliometric statistics at a level of quality, quality in terms of the, the online data that is close to what we pre provided previously based on the web of science data. It's not yet at that level. Um, so we also need to be fair about, uh, uh, well, areas in which further progress is needed. And Leticia already mentioned curation. Uh, and yes, indeed, looking at in particular the quality of the links between publications and um, uh, um, articles, that's crucial, of course. If you, uh, up to between publications and institutions, that's crucial if you make a university ranking. Those links still need some further improvement. Um, perhaps I can very briefly share how we assess quality. We did it manually for a sample and we found mistakes in the open Alex data. Not, it's not just open Alex, it's also our own processing of the open Alex data. But the final thing, there are mistakes, there are inaccuracies. And for some universities, it is, it is substantial. For most, it is, it is minor. But we also found mistakes in the old thing, in the thing we did based on web of science. And when we started to check the whole thing and to manually uh, assess the quality, we also saw mistakes. And partly because mistakes made by web of science, also mistakes made in, in, in the team here in Leiden. Um, so there are mistakes everywhere. That's inevitable with analysis at this scale and with the level of data curation that is needed for this. But the truth is there were more mistakes in the in the Open Alex data, uh, about three times as many as we found in, in with Web of Science. Um, so that's still sub substantial. But we have seen all this improvement in the Open Alex data quality over the past one and a half years, basically. So my expectation, based also on the, on the contact we have with open Alex colleagues is that they will continue to improve their data. Um, and I think the gap between open Alex and the proprietary data sources will soon be closed. That's my kind of prediction based on the way I see how the whole landscape develops. So that's the story of what we did. Thank you, Ludo. And again, thank you for being very sincere also about the, the mistakes. That's, that's really good to know. 
Um, and um, Ludo, you said that Leiden, uh, and it's absolutely that's that's the fact. Leiden is at the forefront of of innovation and open science, and I would um, I would say that also uh, France is leading the race here. So, Leticia, a question to you because. Um, there have been some interesting developments uh, in the, the in the open bibliometrics realm in France. There were some bold decisions that uh, were taken by some of the prestigious university research centers in in France, who decided to unsubscribe from proprietary databases. And the French Ministry also is now partnering with Open Alex. So. I would like to ask you from the point of view of your institution, how do these developments impact your institution? And what changes do you foresee because of these decisions in your day-to-day -day operations? Yeah, so we are really happy uh, in my institution to see uh, this movement forward and to see that um, uh, we are not relying only on proprietary databases anymore. Um, so just to give you a little bit of context, so my uh, the Université de Lorraine, it's in the northeast of France, and uh, we have really a strong commitment uh, towards open science. Uh, we have an open science steering board uh, for uh, five years now uh, with operational committees on open publications, open research data, et cetera, et cetera. And regarding the field of uh, bibliometrics, um, we we were actually the first uh, university to have a local open science monitor. So um, first there were a national open science monitor um, uh, really early uh, in um, 2019 and one year after uh, we, we had the first and um, now many, many uh, dozens of institutions have uh, their local open science monitor following the, the same methodology. So um, we are really trying to um, impulse change in this domain. And um, in the really the, the specific field of bibliometrics uh, that we are doing for our research units, um, I must say that we have spent um, many, many years cleaning up uh, proprietary databases so that um, everything is clean, etc. Um, but I was really happy um, to hear you, Ludo, saying that uh, you had some mistakes. Uh, we had to, um, in spite of our uh, work, um, Every time we had to check uh, the affiliations uh, in these databases, we saw that uh, there were still some mistakes. So uh, I guess we are tired to provide uh, this work for free um, and to pay to have this work online. So um, we, yes, we, we are really in line uh, with um, the ministry and uh, it's a partnership uh, with Open Alex, which is, I think, really uh, giving a strong impulse um, nationally. Um, and um, at the level of my university, we are also uh, supporting Open Alex. And uh, we are currently uh, in the process of seeing how we could um, have um, some curation uh, done uh, because we have uh, really an action plan. Um, for uh, next next year um, with open bibliometrics in my university. Um, so we are going to um, clean up our affiliations, um, the, the few mistakes that we saw um, through um, the works magnet. So maybe I will be able to say a quick word about it. Um, we are also going to switch our bibliometrics reports uh, where uh, when when the creation is done, uh, we will stop uh, using proprietary databases to um, to produce these reports uh, and using Open Alex instead. And we are also uh, currently um, um, preparing um, training sessions for our uh, PhD students and researchers on Open Alex. So um, we are. Yeah, active, actively working on it. 
And yeah, uh, I've mentioned the works magnet. Um, maybe Jason would like also to say something about it. Uh, it's something developed by the French Ministry of Higher Education and Research. So it's an online tool uh, in which you can um, correct affiliations directly, um, uh, mistakes between op open Alex affiliations and uh, raw um identifiers so the register of, of um oh i don't remember Roar. um um well you know the identifier for institutions and research units so yeah we are really mm -hmm. looking Roar. forward roar r o r is that and so yeah that's our plan so as you can see um this is really going to change many things um on the day-to-day -day operations thank you jason do you want to add something to to it especially about the works magnet part um well first i'd, I'd like to say uh what um just what amazing collaborators both Ludo and and Leticia are. Um, this uh, and and how important this this collaboration is, um, and like it's just so great that you know Ludo is is so upfront about how um, Open Alex's data is not good enough. Um, it's not where it needs to be, and that is so important in a collaboration. Um, you, like we we value that so much more than than a potential collaborator who will you know say oh but they're free like let's let's not tell it to their face it, it would be rude to tell them uh, that that their data quality isn't isn't good um, we're just going to complain about it behind their back and not really use them no this is this is the way this collaboration should work and you know it it hurts me a little to to hear that that we're not good enough yet. But we are driven and we are, yeah, we are going to get there. Uh, we are closing the gap, as Ludo said. And these are, and as also as Ludo said, the, this is important. Um, there's there's a lot at stake here. There's uh, there's stakeholders that that you know, um, it's it's not it's not good good enough to to say hey we're we're free and uh, and open, but like um, so we're not going to be as good. Like that's not the case. We we are. And uh, also, like collaborators like Leticia, and I, like I do appreciate uh, you saying like the, your partnership with with Open Alex, and like that's amazing. But my sense also, uh, at least, and this might be changing, um, but at least in the beginning, the commitment and the 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 steps taken weren't really about um, a commitment to Open Alex. It was a commitment to open openness and open science. Um, and that was the step that that France took. It was a very bold step, um, but just saying like we're not going to do the proprietary thing anymore. Uh, and so it, it wasn't really about us at all. It was it was more about taking that step and hey, somebody needs to rise to the challenge. And I think Open Alex has that drive and that commitment, and we are the ones uh, who are going to rise, who are rising to that challenge. And um, it's sounding like like. Uh, your university and and a lot of friends is on board with with saying hey open Alex is the one we're going to go with because uh they are rising to that challenge but again it's not not really about us it's about the openness it's about switching to to this uh open future um and and a collaborative effort to make that possible um the worst magnet I don't have much to add about about that, because um, we've just started talking about it internally, but we're really excited about it as a tool to um, to do uh, to scale up our our uh, specifically our institutional um, data and and collaborative uh, duration of that data. Uh, it is definitely something we struggle with is 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 the systems behind the data curation. Um, as more and more people are interested in in, in helping to improve our data. We, you know, we we hit that ceiling of being a, a, sm a very small team that's that's trying to do a lot of things. Um, and I think this this uh, is yeah, we're really excited about this as a way to 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 scale that up in particular. And we're also making a a bunch of of um, really cool changes in our institutional 
parsing and, and the, the technical side of, of how we handle that data, how we get uh, new affiliation, raw affiliation strings and translate that into matches. Um, and the collaboration with, with Roar as well, which Lisa which mentioned, um, has been has been fantastic. Uh, that's another part of this this collaborative effort is is the uh, the interconnected um, open uh, infrastructure uh, like Roar, like Orchid, like like Crossref and DataSite. Um, just being able to to meet with these partners to to work on it together. And Roar has been a fantastic collaboration. Uh, it's it's makes things so much easier for us to rely on them for institutional data to uh, fix things upstream when there are errors. So we don't have to just have a layer on top of, of, of something like that, of a, of a registry. Um, yeah, so. Uh, yeah. I think Jason, if I may, may, may add something to what you just said, I think your last remark is, is very important. Your remark about this actually being an ecosystem in which all of us, we can be successful only thanks to the efforts that others are also making. So you mentioned, in addition to your own work, the work by 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 Crossref, by Roar, by DataSite, etc. And in in a certain sense, I think this is perhaps the crucial difference between the open approach and the more traditional proprietary approach. In the proprietary system. There's one actor that kind of makes this promise, like we are going to deliver high quality data to you, but we expect you to pay for it. And um, I think in the open system, the promise is, of course, openness, but the promise also, from my point of view, is about um, 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 developing more collaborative ways to actually deal with these hugely complex challenges of, 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 of data curation. And I think what I learned over the past 15 years or so, I learned that there, there won't be any single organization, not let's say a, a, a commercial actor, not Open Alex, not my center. There will not be any single organization that is able to really kind of solve all these problems around data cleaning curation. We can only solve it together. Um, and that requires this level of openness because openness means the data can be shared and all of that. Um, and that's why in a certain way, the open approach is fundamentally better than the proprietary one. Um, and that's perhaps also why it's in some sense it's a mistake to say like is open Alex data of higher or of lower quality than for instance web of science or scopus data that's a mistake because that's still thinking in the old way we have one data source a proprietary one and an open one and we want to know which one is better that's actually old-fashioned because in the open system we should think more about the ecosystem as a whole and thinking at the ecosystem level also will make clear that if there are problems with the data quality um it means that someone in the ecosystem should do a better job. Could be you, Jason, could be your team, could be my team in the case of the Leiden ranking, could be Leticia's university, if, if, yeah. if they should do better curation, could be publishers uh, like PLOS. So we all have a role here. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, and if we all take that responsibility, then kind of it's clear we will move to, to the best possible kind of curation that you can get for your data. Um, Ludo, thank you very much. I very much like this this idea of uh, you know an ecosystem where each stakeholder has something to to contribute and feel responsible for. So looking ahead, I would like to ask you, um, what are your predictions for the adoption of open bibliometrics in the European research area? Because let's be honest, you both come from institutions who are very much pro open science, um, but of course, there are many other institutions uh, in this uh, in this uh, area where um, perhaps open science is not priority. Perhaps for some reasons, uh, people might be skeptical, holding back about open bibliometrics. How do you see the community utilizing or perhaps resisting open bibliometrics in, let's say, the next five years? Let's let's put a cap on five years. Would you like to go first, Leticia? I, I can try. Yeah, um, I think um, people might be afraid to switch to uh, towards open bibliometrics now, but uh, with this so very favorable context, we have the Barcelona Declaration, we have the Open Leiden Ranking, we have uh, the fast really fast development of open Alex. and i might say i've tried to um to to patch um a first version of a training um 
some time ago and I had to redo it because uh, the user interface is improving um, really, really fast. So uh, I'm, I'm going to wait a bit to, to do it again. <laughs> but yeah, uh, it's really, really moving fast and moving better. Uh, so I think that um, when we are going, when people are going to see that it's so much easier to get what you want, you know, to have um, results that are more relevant, um, I guess it, 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 it can only work. Um, I have a really concrete example um, of that. Uh, we had a meeting about our um, uh, European Alliance of Universities um, and um, people that are not necessarily interested in open science in general, um, project managers for uh, European alliances, for instance, or um, um, you know, high level uh, people uh, from different universities, they were wondering, well, um, we would be interesting to have KPIs on um, 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 development goals, uh, sustainable development uh, goals, uh, for each of the universities of uh, this alliance. And well, we don't know how to, to do that, to have like a dashboard of the publications that are, uh, you know, in this objective. Um, and I was at this meeting and I've told them, well, I can show you in two minutes with OpenAlex. And they were like, oh my God, really? <laughs> so, um, I think we have to uh, provide this information in different contexts, um, not, not keep it inside open science enthusiastics, but also to um, stakeholders and, um, and well, uh, research organizations. So I'm quite optimistic for the next five years. Yeah. Perhaps from my point of view, what I could say is, I think for me, it's quite clear that ultimately we will move to a system where all this data, this data that is so kind of fundamental for the things we do in science, that data is, is all going to be open. That's kind of just clear when you think about all the benefits this has, but also when you think about uh, the bigger landscape in which we will actually have only more data in the future. There's more and more things that we all do in digital ways and all these things can we can keep track of, of all these activities and that's going to happen and, and, and that's going to offer new opportunities. So we're going to be more and more kind of uh, uh, making use of data to support our decision making and, and these things. But scaling up this, uh, the way we use data to kind of run and manage uh, our system, that kind of only works if you do it in an open way because in these kind of in this the traditional way which you could say is a siloed way where you have one database that provides this data another database that provides that data but you are not allowed or not able to link them you cannot really get out of the data what what what, what it could potentially offer to you um so so it's, it's clear that we are going to move in that direction but the timelines are i think more difficult to predict so sometimes when i'm in a good mood i make bold predictions um but sometimes when when yeah when you also see kind of of course that, that things move slowly and that some people kind of are, are, are not convinced yet then then i'm a bit more pessimistic about what which timelines might be realistic so it's, it's hard to predict for my center it's clear we have committed to this three four year timeline that's what we the time we allow ourselves to make the full transition in all the work we do and we do a lot of bibliometric work um, but for Kind of Europe, the European system, it's it's a bit more difficult to to predict. Although this the declaration that Leticia already mentioned, the Barcelona declaration, as uh, as as uh, many of the participants in this webinar may know, it has a lot of uh, support, especially in Europe. So that's I think a very positive uh, positive sign. Um, and I'm involved in this declaration, and and um, so. I also know that there's lots of conversations still going on organizations that have not yet publicly uh, expressed their support, but that actually um, are behind the message of, of, of this declaration that do want to move, even though it's perhaps a bit too early for them to state that publicly. 
Jason, are you similarly optimistic? Yes, I would say I I am. Um, I I mean it's it's very exciting. Uh, I think one thing I want to stress is is um, sort of Ludo Ludo mentioned that it's inevitable, sort of, and I I I kind of agree with that. There's there's clear momentum towards uh, an open future. I think um, that's that's uh, that's that's likely going to happen. But um, one thing, and this this isn't necessarily coming from from me, but uh, more Jason Freem, our, our our visionary CEO at Open Alex. Um, but we we know that it's not enough to be open. We're excited to be part of this open ecosystem. We're fully on board with it. Of course, it's it's in our name. It's uh, we we actually mean it as part of our name. Um, it's uh, but but we're as open alex as a as a um company and as a product developer are not just interested in in being the most open solution we also want to be great and we want to be easy to use um and and so uh like we are developing very rapidly um but we're getting to a place where uh once you go outside of this of this group of of open science and open bibliometrics enthusiasts to people who don't care as much about that and don't, you know, don't don't follow it, aren't aren't just like uh, inclined to be on board with with it because it's open. Um, we need we we know that we need to present them with something that is as good as the alternatives or better. And uh, in some ways, we already have that. We are we are aggressively working working towards that. Uh, and I I think that's also. Um, going to play play a role i think like the the fact that um open alex has frankly a a, a really uh nice team of, of people working with with connections to the the overall ecosystem and the the community um i think i think we're pretty well positioned and so i am i am optimistic good i think that we will park here on this optimistic note because that's a good way to park. Um, thank you very much for, sh for sharing your thoughts. We uh, now will take questions from the audience. So please use Q&A. And ooh, we already have some questions here. Okay, 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 okay. So um, question number one uh, to Jason. Jason, what would be your advice for institutions who consider moving away from the use of proprietary databases to open Alex? Um, my advice would be to, to start conversations uh, with us. You probably won't be talking to me uh, necessarily, unless it's specifically things about the data, about the database, the use of the data. Um, but we have uh, members on our team who uh, have, I, I'm sure, I'm sure Leticia has, has worked with some of them or, or her colleagues have, uh, who, who will have extensive, extensive discussions with you um about that and and that's part of this 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 openness like we we are very interested in working uh in working with you uh other advice i would i would probably defer to to leticia here or uh, other people who have actually been on the other side uh but yeah definitely the the collaborative conversation i think is key Yeah, I agree. We, we are really, really happy with this partnership because we have this opportunity to uh, explain um, our own little French problems, you know, uh, <laughs> with affiliations. Uh, we are I'm not trivial. I... Yeah, we are the <laughs> champions uh, with problems, uh, I think, uh, <laughs> for affiliations. French, you mean? <laughs> yeah. Good. So, yeah, uh, just uh, have a chat with the Open Science team and uh, the Open Alex team, sorry, and they will have um, uh, appropriate answers. Great, perfect. There is another question also from Ershabet. Thank you, Ershabet, for all your questions. That's great. So this one is for Leticia. So Leticia, you mentioned that open bibliometrics will not mitigate um, excessive quantification of research assessment. 
Do you see any trends that act against that? How about narrative bibliometrics? Yeah, I think that narrative bibliometrics are uh, really um, an important trail that we have to follow. Um, and there are also initiatives uh, like um, so the Open Sense Monitoring Initiative uh, that is um, getting structured um, as we speak. Um, it, we we have tried um, to propose uh, principles for open science monitoring that are currently uh, reviewed and uh, open to consultation. Um, by uh, this consultation is organized by UNESCO, so we want to have inputs for from uh, many many people from all over the world. Um, we don't want open science to become um, a field where you have uh, rankings, individual rankings, and um, keep K KPIs um, only quantitative. So uh, there is this initiative and uh, the Koara uh, initiative also um, is, uh, is moving forward also to use only open uh, data sources to mitigate um, uh, the um, excess uh, made by impact factor and that kind of thing. But I still think that we have to progress on that and to provide some more work uh, to, to avoid uh, creating new uh, dangerous KPIs. Thank you, Leticia. Uh, next question is for Jason. So Jason, have you considered using machine learning slash AI methods for data curation or analysis at OpenAlex? And uh, how are you observing these developments? Yeah, absolutely. The, the, uh, the answer is yes. And we've implemented a, a, a whole host of, of machine learning and AI uh, um, methods uh, for data curation. We have, we have a dedicated team member who's the lead on our, our AI uh, integrations and development. Um, it's it's too big a topic to really talk about now, um, but just suffice to say uh, the advancement of, of these methods and the um, accessibility of them is is a key part of why we're able to, to why, why we're in this crucial moment and why we're able to do what we do, um, specifically about doing uh doing data curation and and offering this data this fairly massive uh database scientific knowledge graph really um with such a small team of people uh and so yeah the the i mean the the algorithms and the, the computation that goes into um collecting the the, the data and curating it um is a crucial part of what we do. It's also um, definitely a lot of work to evaluate the methods, to develop the methods, to make sure that we're doing it responsibly. Um, we, we, we've probably all heard stories about irresponsible use of AI, even in, in the uh, scholarly communication space. And so uh, we definitely have to be, be mindful of all of that. Um, uh, but, and, yeah, if we had time, I could I could give some more specific examples. But we use machine learning in in our institution parsing. We're using machine learning in our our topics and aboutness uh, classification um, in our sustainable development goals uh, classifications. Um, so yeah, uh, uh, a whole host of things there. And our documentation actually, if you if you uh, are just curious of, of taking a stroll through through some of our methods. Uh, has a lot of that, and um, we're about to to uh, to do a big update on our documentation too. So make that stuff easier to find. Thank you so much, Jason. I am mindful of time here because we have one minute left. So I will just cherry pick one last question, if that's fine, and we can go back to to all the other questions. Uh, perhaps we can uh, answer them in writing and then uh, send them um, around to um, to the registrants. So um, another question for Jason. Jason, you are you are we are grilling you here. 
Um, so, but this one uh, is quite interesting. So the most crucial point with data for bibliometrics is quality. How do you make sure that no predatory journals or other fraud contents is included? And in case it was included, will this type of content be removed again from the database or stay there as in some commercial databases? Yeah, this is this is a very tricky topic. Um, we definitely have, you know, we have standards, but there there is no like there is no clear line between what is a, a predatory journal and what is not. Um, if there was, it, it would make things a lot easier, but it's it's just not the case. So it's it's sort of a case by case basis right now. It's it's uh, it, where we are developing like standards and methods for this as as we go. We we have an idea of what is appropriate content to include, which is a lot more inclusive than the proprietary databases that have traditionally been. Um, we don't can you know we can they they shut out a lot of things in the name. Uh, partly in the name of of keeping the quality up and shutting out it, uh, predatory journals or inappropriate journals, but at the expense of um, shutting out a lot of uh, of of you know disproportionately disadvantaged communities and and sources of of scientific data that we don't don't want to shut out. So by that very nature, we're probably inviting in some things that are. Uh, more things that are inappropriate, as you mentioned, like the proprietary da databases have some too. Um, and so, yeah, it's always going to be uh, a case by case basis as long as there are these bad actors. Um, we we there are some cases where it's very clear what shouldn't be included, and we uh, will get rid of that data. We don't we don't want we don't want fraud in there. We don't want spam in there. It's like clearly, those those things are not appropriate scholarly content. But there is a lot of, of gray area there, and it's it's actually something you know we want to keep the community engaged in and have keep having discussions. It's it's definitely a concern of a lot of people. But when you get down to the nitty gritty, it is it is tough to to know what is a predatory journal and how to uh, you know defend it from that. There's also just to mention um, things like like curated journal sets can help depending on your analysis. Um, I think CWTS has given us a list of of uh, journals that they've curated. We have the DOAJ list. Um, these are all filters you can apply on top of our data that will improve the quality of data depending on on your specific analysis. And it might be appropriate to shut out certain types of articles or shut out certain sources uh, or include certain sources. We we want to offer those as filters instead of just purging data that that might be uh you know useful to, to have and and appropriate for our mission of inclusivity thank you so much jason and um i will park us here um because we are already over time thank you so much for a, a truly interesting and engaging discussion also thank you um to the audience for showing up for asking your questions. I hope that we made you somewhat hungry for the next episode in this series. The next one will take place in autumn. I am not sure what the subject will be quite yet. If you have some proposals, you can always contact me. Um, and um, for all the questions that we didn't manage to answer during the session, I will make sure that we will get back to you with, with answers um, uh, to these questions. So uh, hopefully, See you all back in autumn for the next episode. And for now, happy summer and have a lovely weekend. Thank you very much, Agatha. For Thank, you very Thank, much. You so much. Thank you very much. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.